GNC 591. It's Friday, July 9th, and you're listening to the Geek News Central Podcast, sponsored by GoDaddy.com. Geek News Central is a primary the tech podcast network. Everybody got a great show for you. You know what comes next. Strap in. Here it comes. All right, people, I need a go no go for the Geek News Central podcast. Digital archive recorders. We're go fly. Microphone. We're go fly. Video feed. Go. Web browser. Go. RSS data stream aggregator. Go fly. Interflux totism suppressor. All right, I'm confused. Host readiness check. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. The Geek News Central podcast is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to go. Q Todd in five. Bucky, Bucky, who's got the button? Four. There is no cause for alarm. Three. Everybody hold on to something. Two. Just press the button. One. It's showtime. Aloha and welcome to the Geek News Central podcast, coming to you as live as it can be from the beautiful state of Hawaii and via the Geek News Central studio overlooking greater Oahu. Hey, everyone, welcome to the show. My name is Todd Cochran. Of course, I want to encourage you to get over to Geek News Central. Dot com. Check out all the great content over there. Of course, check out our archived podcast via the podcast link on the website. He want to give a special welcome, of course, a special thank you to our sponsor, GoDaddy.com. And if you're looking for a domain name, dedicated server, virtual dedicated server, shared hosting account, whatever it may be in the, in the online department, GoDaddy.com is really the place to go. It is the place to go and find the best deals on online web hosting, Again, dedicated servers, virtual dedicated servers, and so forth. And, of course, when you get to the checkout counter, don't forget your geek here at Geek News Central because you want to use my promo code, Todd. That'll save you 10% on your order. Of course, Geek 5 will save you 15% on orders $20 or more. Todd 20 will save you 20% on a one-year shared hosting account. I want to thank GoDaddy for being a longtime sponsor here at the show. And, of course, uh, hey, you know where to go. Again, go over to GoDaddy. Dot com. Okay, let's go ahead and, of course, we want to welcome all the new listeners to the show. Hey, thanks for uh, checking us out for the very first time. And uh, as I said in the beginning here, make sure you get over to geeknewcentral.com. Sign up for our newsletter. Our newsletter will contain all the items that I talk about during tonight's show. And uh, some of you on Gmail had a little problem with the last newsletter that I sent out. And apparently it all wasn't the newsletter's fault. It was apparently impartial. Uh, Gmail's fault. Gmail had an issue, and uh, so we're going to keep our fingers crossed tonight that uh, that thing is sent out, um, basically, and it goes out, and you guys get it in its full format with all the graphics and so forth in. I'm going to do like, a couple of small changes, but uh, if you're new, again, sign up for that newsletter. You can find the newsletter link on the website, and uh, that will get you the latest and greatest about the show, and really, again, everything I talk about. Of course, I want to give a warm welcome to the Ohana. You know, we have a uh, a lot of you are longtime listeners of the show. Thanks for being part of the family, of course. And uh, I think that uh, you know, as the show grows and the the really the family of listeners grow, uh, we be really become a, a powerful force. And you guys are starting to send me a lot of content uh, to talk about during the show. Lots of links. I'm getting uh, uh, more voice sales than ever. So thanks for continuing to uh, support the show and make sure you get over to. A geek. Actually, if you have comments on the show, geeknews at gmail.com or the voicemail hotline at uh, plus one six one nine three four two seven three six five. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. You can find that in the second column of the website. There's a place there for you to uh, subscribe to uh, the blog. There's a way you can subscribe to the podcast. And uh, if you just look on the main website, of course, there's a video link as well, a special event feed. So uh, get signed up for that. It's in the orange box on the website at, uh, at geeknewcentral.com. You use uh, iTunes or Zoom Marketplace. And, of course, you can follow me at Twitter. And I'm at the Geek News on, on Twitter. Of course, if you are uh, watching us on the Roku or Boxy, hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for you know, kicking back in your lazy boy and watching the show. Uh, this is really kind of a cool way to watch the show. And, uh, again, getting more email from the Roku listeners. You guys are sending me feedback on the show as well. I appreciate that, and we're working on uh, some enhancements to the show. So uh, it's hopefully it'll get a little more interactive for you, and it won't just be me looking at the camera or at the screen so much. And, uh, hey, I tell you what, busy week. The team, uh, you know, even though it's a short week, everything started really on Tuesday because of the, the holiday here in the United States. But um, Angelo and Brian have been busy interviewing 
a potential new client or new new uh, uh, a new a hire at uh, at Raw Voice, and uh, they started the uh, in person interviews today. So I was on and off the phone a couple of times with them when they were doing that. So pretty excited about that. You know, my accountant's driving me crazy though. I have to give her credit, Wendy. If if you're watching, um, yes, I know I I owe you some paperwork. <laughs> She is uh she is a saint. She's very very patient, Todd. I need this paperwork. Doesn't doesn't get uh, get on me too bad until I get really late. So uh, I hopefully we'll be able to get caught up and get her all the paperwork she needs <laughs> so I can have that to turn in uh turn in Monday. So uh Wendy, thanks for that. Hey, um I do have a little bit of an update today. I got a call and I can't really disclose at this point who called me. But we may have a home for the TriCaster that's currently being used on this show. And uh, there's still some things to work out, uh, some finances to work out for that individual to take uh, over the, uh, um, the TriCaster. But what it may end up being is really being able to keep the uh, TriCaster within the, uh, I guess for a better word, within the family. And uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. And it give uh, give us a little more resources all around, uh, so uh, I'm pretty happy with that. So that uh, that's really kind of a, um, a, a really kind of good news, and we'll 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 know what uh, the decision is here in a couple of days to make sure that uh, uh, essentially the uh, the banker is going to allow it to happen, <laughs> and then uh, I will be pressing forward to uh, to ordering the new TCDXD850, and uh, we're really excited about some of the new features that offers to be able to. Uh, really ramp things up here. Of course, all of you that are listening to the show, you guys still, you guys remain my number one audience, uh, and you always will be. And uh, thanks for putting up with me for my uh, video comments from time to time. But I think you guys will agree as we cover more stuff in the show, you're going to see that there is a paradigm shift that is fast approaching all of us. As a matter of fact, uh, Tom Wiles, of course, he is the host of the Trucker Tom podcast, did an article on. Uh, Geek News Central yesterday basically talking about paid content, paying for content online that we basically can get like Hulu and so forth. And it's it's a really kind of a – it's it's definitely a time where us as consumers are going to be able to have more choices. And we're not necessarily going to be locked into our cable providers forever. And I really think there's going to be a dynamic change here uh, this fall when the, when the 500-pound gorilla in the room really jumps into the fray. And Google TV is introduced in a big way. Now, if you're thinking about buying a TV, I, I would wait. I really, really would. I would wait to this fall. And if you're a Sony fan, definitely wait because um, there's going to be some exciting stuff coming. I just can't wait to see what they're going to introduce. Um, and there's going to be, a, you know, if you're, if you, depending on where you shop, will also depend on what uh, what's going to be. Um, integrated within your actual television sets that you're going to be buying. But uh, the whole digital experience is going to go through another radical transformation here over the next 24 months. I think what we've seen so far is really just the initial groundswell of what is to come, and uh, and I'm excited about that. I really, really am. I want to remind you we've got new items in the Ohana store, and uh, get over there to Cafe press.com forward slash ohana store pick up your uh, ohana wear uh, sam's been doing a great job and matter of fact sam i know you're listening um i gotta get back with you uh been actually talking with uh, my developer team at raw voice and of course brian was the initial designer of of geek news central uh the latest uh, version of that and uh, we may actually have him actually implement your design i'll talk about that with you uh separately i know you got a whole bunch of great ideas you know, really, I, I think uh, Sam really kind of at some point here, I'm going to have to designate him a super insider. <laughs> and because uh, he goes way, he's going way above and beyond the call of duty for the show. And, and I appreciate it. Um, but anyone can become an insider by going to geeknewcentral.com forward slash insider. And, of course, uh, proceeds of your donations to the show help me replace my salary so that we can expand the staff here at GNC. And, uh, and bring on some help. Now, I talk about the interview stuff. That's all with Raw Voice. That's a completely separate entity, separate company. But what I do here is run under my mantra, Podcast Connect Incorporated, and uh, what we do, the podcast awards on and so forth. And matter of fact, I, t I wrote an article on Podcast Connect this uh, couple of days ago talking about the podcast awards. 
few people really realize the manpower and man hours that is required to make that thing go off without a hitch. Now, for five or six years now, uh, audience members from this show have been really uh, very uh, forthcoming in their time and helped grading uh, the variety of shows that get nominated and coming up with our voting slate. And they put in a lot of time. And I think those that have done that before can attest to that, that you put in a lot of time. And I have to really consider this year where I'm headed with the Podcast Awards site and contest, um, trying to decide whether I want to invest the time because I'm already strapped. Uh, so maybe I might be thinking about bringing on someone to, to help. And uh, so, I'm, you know, basically looking probably for another podcaster to really step in and uh, manage the day-to-day -day operations of that and help me really uh, take that uh, event to another level. So um, last year was the first year that uh, I really did not break even. I came out of pocket. Uh, the number of, uh, of course, with the economy being down, the number of sponsorships were down. Cost of trophies were going up. And uh, so I don't know. I don't know if I want to come out of pocket another $1,000 for that event uh, this year. Um, so I have to really think about where we're headed with that. I'd love to hear you guys' feedback. You guys know that uh, it's really kind of early to talk about podcast awards, but I'm kind of at a decision point on where to go. And if you are a podcaster and you are willing to forego being, a, uh, being nominated and be willing to help out uh, logistically with that, uh, send me an email. And why you think you should be, you know, why you should qualify to do that. And any ideas on what you may have to take that uh, to the next level. Okay, um, what else is in my list here? Make sure that, um, again, check out the Ohana store. Favorite the website on Facebook. We appreciate that. that. We, and, of course, we gave away our Lenovo Think Center A63. We actually got a voicemail from the winner. I'll play that at the end of the show. If you've got a Wi-Fi network, change it to geeknewscentral.com. Uh, and, of course, I want to direct your guys' attention to uh, one of the sponsors here of the show. That's Matrix Direct. You know you know how important life insurance really is. It helps provide a safety net for your loved ones, and really it should be an essential part of every family's financial plan. It is of mine. But maybe you put off buying coverage because you thought it would be too complicated or possibly even too expensive. Well, guess what? It doesn't have to be that way. I've discovered coverage through Matrix Directs. They can save you up to 75% or even more on, life term, on term life insurance. And you're not going to have to jump through a lot of hoops to set up. Um, the licensed insurance agents at Matrix Direct will manage the process from start to finish so you don't have to. They'll even help you get started with your application process. You can do that by going over to Matrix Direct, matrixdirect.com forward slash podcast. There'll be a link in the show notes on this. And uh, check it out. Fill out the information over there, and they'll give you all the details. As a disclaimer, policies issued by American General Life Insurance Company, Houston, Texas, not available in all states. Again, for all details about this advertisement, please visit Matrix Direct online at matrixdirect.com forward slash podcast. And uh, thanks for Matrix Direct for being a sponsor here at, uh, at Geek News Central. And check them out. All right, let's go ahead and get into the, the content here. I got a stack of stuff for you tonight, probably more than I can cover in my allotted time. It was an hour and 19 minutes, the last show, and boy, I tell you, I was really trying to bust them out at the end to get the articles all done. And um, let me go ahead and bring this up so that we're ready to roll into this. Um, probably the big news of the day on the science front was that Solar Impulse, this is the solar-powered airplane, uh, landed after 26 hours in the air. And uh, so that means that uh, while they were airborne, uh, what uh, they had enough battery power to sustain them through the night, and uh, this took care, this took uh, place um, in Europe. So uh, pretty, pretty impressive feat here. Now the folks that were doing that are going to be going back to, actually it was in Switzerland. Uh, that's where the air, aircraft landed at Perrin Airport near Bern, Switzerland. And so now the team is going to go back to the woodshed, I guess, and. Uh, develop a plane that will hopefully circumvent the go by, globe by 2013. Uh, this article was uh, over at uh, Engadget.com. Of course, I have all the links up in the show notes. They're at geeknewscentral.com and also is delivered via the, uh, the, the uh, newsletter service. Hey, iOS 4, you know, 
when we were at CES last year, there was all kinds of folks that were coming up with the little DJ devices where you can mix and scratch and do all kinds of cool things with different devices. But the iOS 4 API has uh, been updated with approximately 1,500 new API calls. And what's different here is with the new iOS 4 API, um, these DJ apps now can actually um, reach into the iTunes music library that's on your phone. That was not possible before. You used to have to load a separate library up, which was pretty clumsy. So um, there's a pretty cool video here for those of you that have or like mixing music or playing around with it. And I'm sure your kids are going to love this on, on, the, uh, on the iPod Touch. Uh, but it's, there's a video on YouTube called the Flare Ad. And uh, I have this linked up for you in the show notes. And you'll see what's really is, is going to be coming to, uh, to an iPhone or an iTouch near you. It's uh, some, some cool stuff these folks are coming up with. They really are. And uh, it's impressive where they're, where they're headed with this. Hey, Fring has uh, really pushed the edge, too. You guys know that uh, they've got the, the face-to-face type of uh, video conferencing when you're on Wi-Fi. But the Fring has been updated for the iPhone, and now it does video calling with the front cam over 3G. I was looking at some of the um, video quality, and so far a little hazy, but um, we will see how it goes. But uh, it only works between two iPhone version, basically iPhone 4s, and uh, so, you know, also make sure you got your clothes on when you, uh, when you make a call with, uh, with Fring, okay? Don't surprise your, uh, your neighbor. And you don't know what's really going to happen here, and this is a thing that uh, all of us as parents need to be watching out for, is make sure you're talking to your kids about these video applications, because if your son or daughter is lucky enough to have an iPhone, and they're off in their room, and they call their boyfriend, you know, kids will be kids, so we need to be careful that they're not uh, doing things over the video uh, connections that they shouldn't be. Now, of course, this, you know, kids have had webcams on their, car- on their computers for years, but now it's real easy to go into the, you know, into their bedroom and, and sneak a video call uh, with the boyfriend or girlfriend, vice versa. So we need to really caution them on this. Uh, I just wonder how long it will be before we have our first... Uh, arrest of a minor doing something they're not supposed to be over uh, uh, these video chats. And uh, for those of you that are adults, be careful out there too. Okay, Um, the FDA today has approved the telescopic eye implant. We talked about this probably a year ago on the show. And of course, this is maybe not even that long, but um, this uh, telescopic eye implant has, again, approved by the FDA, and it is uh, designed to really be used in adults that uh, generally are older in age that have uh, severe macro degeneration. And you know, really, what really makes me sad here is that my grandmother would have been an absolute perfect candidate uh, for this, uh, this device. And um, it's exciting to see what they have been able to accomplish here. And uh, it's going to be, again, for patients that are generally 75 years of age or older and uh, who are suffering, again, from end-stage uh, macular degeneration. And uh, it's a pretty tricky surgery, but they feel that uh, they're going to be able to uh, get this in a relatively inexpensive, $15,000. And believe me, that's uh, very inexpensive for a dramatic in- improvement in quality of life. So we'll keep an eye on this and see how it goes. And if you know if you know of anyone that is participating in the trials or maybe a candidate for this, make sure you let them know about it, all right? We all don't like unsightly cables. And one of the challenges that we've had here is when we first moved into this home, um, it's a very open floor plan. And when they built the house, they didn't put any power sockets in the floor. So really, I have to rely on ways to hide cables to have lamps plugged in and so forth. Now, when we had carpet down, it wasn't an issue. But when we pulled the carpet out and basically uh, allowed our laminate floors to be, yes, laminate, (laughs) uh, to be, um, you know, that's what we were, we just basically ripped the carpet out. And uh, because the floors had laminate down before when we moved in, but, you know, for whatever reason, we we never... uh, went with bare wood floors to begin with, 
And so now my challenge is, is how to hide the cables effectively. So I found a company, and I've been doing some searching here, but some companies out there are actually creating little uh, cute devices in order to hide cables. And uh, just for this purposes, you know, we become so electrically connected and different stuff that we end up with these unsightly power strips, you know, with, with five plugs poked into them with another extension cord. And, you know, we've all seen it, right? Along with our laptop power, you know, they, no one wants to see that stuff. One company called Blue Lounge Cable Box, it really doesn't manage your cables, but instead you can stuff them all inside and kind of hide them. And they come in uh, multiple colors. And uh, you can pick buy one of these for, you know, 30 bucks, or you can go down to your Walmart or Target store and pick something similar up as well. But they made it so that the, the cables would go in and out real easy. What are you guys using to hide your cables? And what are you guys doing that uh, have the same situation I do where you have uh, difficulty in getting everything you want plugged in, especially lamps in the areas where there's really no way to hide the cables? How are you guys hiding cables? Love to hear your feedback on that. Geeknews at, uh, at gmail.com. Another article over here on Engadget talking about Cathay Pacific bringing home or introducing 50 meg per second Wi-Fi and uh, live TV and in-flight calling to their fleet. And, uh, boy, I tell you, if I flew places where there was uh, Cathay Pacific, <laughs> I would uh, definitely consider uh, flying these guys on a more regular basis or on a regular basis. But, uh, you know, American Airlines and, and United and all these, very few of them have uh you know, basically Wi-Fi in the aircrafts at this time. But uh, Hong Kong's Cathay Pacific is uh, showing us how it's done here. And uh, by early 2012, Cathay's, Cathay Pacific is going to make available 50 meg per second internet service, in-flight GSM cell phone service, and voice, SMS, and data, as well as live and pay-per-view television uh, for every passenger. That's, that's some exciting stuff. And, you know, some of you say, well, Todd, I don't fly to Believe me, as much time as I spend in an airplane, this would be a welcome addition to uh, in-flight entertainment. But we have our iPads, right? <laughs> or our Kindles. So I guess no matter what, we'll stay entertained. But there's just times I'd like to be able to be online and work, especially on a day flight. There's so much stuff that I do that requires me to be have an Internet connection. It's just like launching all of our campaigns for quarter three. I have to be connected. I have to be able to get into our campaign system and do all the changes. None of it is done really on a spreadsheet. It's all online. So um, especially around the new quarters, it, uh, it, it, I would love to be able, when I'm flying, to be able to connect, be connected up. Hey, uh, Andrew Darlow sent me a, a link last night that totally enthralled me. And the title of the uh, project is called The Digital Emily project. Now, if you've been over to geeknewcentral.com today, you've seen this. And I encourage you to, and I'll have this link up in the show notes for you. Andrew, first of all, thanks for the link. I showed some people this today that I was hanging out with, and they were pretty blown away. Now, we've all seen CGI-based human images, or uh, digitally created human images. I think this project really takes CGI digital imaging to a new level. Because what they did was, is you actually be able to see this individual moving their head, talking, jaw moving, wrinkles on the face, forehead, and so forth. All the facial expression looking very natural. And it's, it's, it's digitally done. And they show you the original gal, and then they show the digital. When you guys see this, I think you're going to be blown away. At least I was. Maybe I don't get enough exposure to this type of stuff. But it really reminded me of, let me actually bring this up on the actual screen. Let me go ahead and flip this for you guys. Um, the, um, the actual uh, things that we saw at Ford with them doing um, all, almost all of their advertising now is done CGI. It's digitally done. It's not really, they don't go out and do expensive shoots places except when people are actually driving the vehicles. But uh, this really took the whole whole thing to a new lane. Basically, what we're going to end up having, folks, is digital actors. And uh, I wonder at what point do uh, the Actors Guild <laughs> get replaced by uh, everything digital? 
You know, we don't need to have to worry about actresses that are going to be uh, going to the L.A. County Jail for 90 days um, because they didn't go to rehab. You know, you just basically uh, sit them down in a chair. You take the, you know, video impression of their face, and then you just do them, you know, they just do their parts digitally. <laughs> it sure takes the, um, um, I guess, the trouble out of having uh, uh, actors that are, I guess, for better words, misbehaving. So um, how many of you guys think she got a good idea she got 90 days? I, I, I think it was great that she got 90 days. <laughs> All right, uh, a new chapter, actually, an end to a long chapter here. Today, the very last space shuttle tank was delivered. And uh, with only two missions left, the, uh, the last tank is out the door on its barge heading to NASA. And... Um, this is a this is a pretty big milestone, a sad one. The uh, there's many of these employees who have worked there for over 37 years, and probably what it's going to end up being is um, layoffs. Now, uh, one of the co uh, corporate uh, contractors today announced layoffs of well over 1,000 uh, shuttle employees. At least gave them their 60-day notice of uh, of being laid off, and. Uh, with many of them being let go. So uh, a lot of uh, scientists going to be looking for, and technicians going to be looking for jobs here in, in the very near future. Now, a lot of rumors going on about Apple TV. And we've all kind of come to the, at least I have, I've come to the realization that more than likely, uh, Apple will be coming out with a new Apple TV based upon the iOS 4 operating system. And it probably will be relatively inexpensive to buy the box, and it will be competing with Roku, be competing with Google TV. Except I don't know how they're going to compete in the walled garden. Basically, you know, Apple is so controlling on the content. I don't know how we'll ever uh, get our content on those devices. We, time will tell. Uh, not that we're sitting still. We're getting ready for the potential of that happening anyway at Raw Voice. But new rumor today by new TV is saying that the new Apple TV is going to push 99 cent streaming TV rentals. So according to some sources, Apple's trying to get TV programmers to let it rent individual TV shows for 99 cents each as opposed to $1.99 it receives for sales of standard definition episodes and two ninety nine it gets for selling HD episodes. Now I'm thinking here for a second I don't know. You guys just do the math. How much TV do you watch a month? Um, I know that I watch certain programming. Um, either, usually on my DVR, I'll watch, uh, yeah, maybe, and I usually it's late at night and I usually fall asleep watching it. Um, maybe a total of two to three hours worth of programming a week that I watch that I put in my DVR. So if I think about that, if it's if I'm doing three hours and my kids that say are doing uh, three to five hours a week, that's uh, eight bucks. My wife does a couple of dollars a week, two or three dollars, so maybe ten. Let me let's let's say ten hours a week of what we're watching of TV regular TV content, and I look at my cable bill, ten dollars a week times four weeks, that would be about forty dollars a month at ninety nine cents a piece, and then if I cut my cable. And I add in my the extra ten bucks they're going to charge me to have internet, so that will raise my internet cost. Of, so I would ha roughly save probably about forty dollars a month by but if I could get all of my TV programming uh, through the device. So that's kind of exciting in my viewpoint. Now I'm sure that the cable companies and there's a lot of articles coming out right now that the cable companies want to own that digital part. They are putting in all kinds of infrastructure. You just watch. The next cable box upgrade that you get will have all this uh, in-box stuff that I'm talking about that's in the Roku and all these other devices, but your cable company is going to control that and charge you for that access. Um, that's what's going to happen. They are really going to be fighting hard to really keep you in their walled garden and, and really not allow OTT to thrive. The genie's out of the bottle. OTT is going to be the – basically everyone's going to know what OTT is, over-the-top TV. We go over – basically over cable, over all these yahoos. We don't have to deal with them, and uh, I think it's going to be big. I think they've all got it figured out. I know 
What do you guys think? Think it's going to be big or think it's going to be small? Where, where do you guys think it's headed? I'd love to hear. I don't get too much feedback on this particular part of my commentary from time to time. But I'd love to hear you guys' feedback. Geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline at 619-342-7365. Hey, Ford is introducing their Ford Sync program, a do not disturb feature. And then what it will do is it blocks calls and texts while driving. And I think this would be a cool feature to have to essentially allow it for parents. If you have a, a 16, 17, eight, 16 and 17 year old driving, of course, when they're 18, they can do whatever they want. But you have a 16 or 17 year old driving, you know, you can lock them out of using, well, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to use the in car system or do you want them to pick up their phone and just talk normal? I don't know. But they do have the ability now to have this do not disturb feature. And uh, basically, it um, ensures that you don't get bothered while you're driving. Some states have very strict usage laws now. And uh, so that would be, uh, be an option. Hey, very first iPhone 4 has uh, caught on fire and been uh, reported back to Apple. Apple's confirmed that there was an issue. Um, essentially, what has happened here and is that uh, there was a fault within the actual uh, USB connection on the phone. So it wasn't in the actual USB port that went to the computer, but where you actually hook up your cable to do your syncing. Um, oh, come on now. This thing is driving me crazy. Okay, yes, this is what I want you to do. No, how come you didn't copy? Copy, okay. What I've got is I've got a mouse that's sitting on my desk. I talked about it last show that the execute button, the left button is sticking, <laughs> driving me crazy. But uh, they confirmed that there was a short circuit in the connection. It wasn't a battery issue. So uh, don't get worried. This is not a battery fire, but uh, just a, uh, a something that melted in an area where you, where you cook up, hook up your phone to sync it. So they'll be looking at that, I'm sure, and we'll see what, uh, what develops. Now that that was over at gizmodo.com as well. Hey, Twitter is forcing media to confront the myth of objectivity. You guys know, and this is an article over on gigaohm.com, you guys know that uh, I'm very objective on this show. <laughs> um, I try to be objective in my own way. I, don't, uh, I do try to force my opinion upon you. <laughs> you guys expect me to do that. And, uh, but, you know, where we don't want to have our, you know, something forced upon us is when we go to, CNN or Fox or MSNBC, we want uh, these commentators to, you know, report the news. Now, we know that there are individuals that have individual shows that uh, that really kind of do their own thing. And you know, you, you know what you're going to get before you start watching that content. But this weekend, a Middle East correspondent uh, twittered something that outraged a lot of people. And she has basically been let go from CNN. Um, the CNN spokesperson said that the, that the individual's comments were an error in judgment and they did not meet CNN's editorial standards. Now, if Twitter had never been around and social media hadn't been exposed, it doesn't expose people's thought process as much as they do, um, you know what we what we find out here are we're allowed now to determine who's being objective and who isn't. So I can say host X. Well, I know he's not objective. He's got agenda, whether whatever network they're on, and every network has their own talking heads that have their own ad agendas and objectives. Then you have the news correspondents that are supposed to be, you know, supposed to be just giving all sides of a story. But generally, it doesn't happen that way, I don't think. Everything is always slanted. But the beauty today and the way media is, is you guys can choose whether or not you want to watch me or listen to one of these journalists knowing whether or not they're being objective. And I don't think before, you know, 25 or 30 years ago, when a news host came on, uh, people were probably, uh, I think the news hosts were probably more careful to be objective than they are now. Um, what do you guys think? What, you know, what is this era? Do you even care about uh, news reporters being objective anymore and showing both sides of a story? Um, we, we, again, excluding those shows that are specifically 
um, basically talk shows or one individual with their with their commentary and their thoughts and processes and whatever they do on their shows. Um, but when they're actually putting the news up and just doing straight news, you expect that content to be pretty objective and give both sides. But um, what do you guys think? Think that news is objective today? A big, big deal on YouTube, and I was excited to see this. I really, really was. Um, I have a, and I loaded it immediately, and I'm looking here at my iPhone. It's the new YouTube, well, basically it's a web-based app, and it really isn't even an app. What happens now is you go, when you go to m.youtube.com, you're going to be prompted to add a bookmark to a page on your iPhone. And really all that, it, it puts the YouTube logo on there and it looks like it's an app, but when you press the button, it really what it does is it loads Safari, it loads up in the browser and you go to m.youtube.com and you can actually control, like an app, um, how the device navigates. And this is not just for the iPhone, it's for any, um, most of the mobile phones will work but here's the it's i think it's awesome because you've got the same functionality of an app but it's again it's all web based and you're not restricted by having to wait to do an update you can do an update on the site anytime you want you don't have to go through uh iTunes submission process as long as the browser is capable you've built one site for multiple phones this is really a smart way for developers to go so I, those of you that are out there developing stuff I, when you get ready to do your mobile sites Really follow what Google's been doing, watching what they've done with uh, with Gmail, and look what they've done with uh, YouTube and all these other sites that Google has made web-based, and it really looks like a web-based application. I don't even want to say that, but uh, you've got full HTML5 capability there, so it's perfect. And uh, I do notice that because my show is so big, I'm going to have to be really thinking about the strategy on how... I'm going to, I may have to start creating more feeds with different size video um, just because sometimes getting the, you know, having a good online experience is much different than having, with your mobile phone is a much different experience than sitting in front of your computer purely from a bandwidth standpoint. But um, the new YouTube mobile site is by far the most fully featured YouTube mobile implementation out there. And uh, I was really excited to explore it. And I was taking screenshots of it, you know, with your phone. And I was taking it and blowing it up. And then I was marking it up and pointing. And I sent it off to my guys. I said, look at this, look at this, look at that. Look what they did there. Look how they implemented it. And I'm sure they're, like, rolling their eyes. But when I see this kind of stuff, it's, uh, it's cool. What do you guys think about the new mobile YouTube site? I think it's exciting. I really do. I think it's, it's fantastic what they've come together with. All right, 10 top iPad apps for the summer. Uh, kayak, traveling means booking flights, and this is the economy finding the best deals as a must. Kayak is a good way to search for flights. Zagat to go, it's one of the greatest joys of vacation, sampling local delicacies. And uh, this is a, a app that you can use to find great places to eat. Free translator, if you're, going, if you're lucky enough to be traveling to a foreign country. Of course, Urban Spoon is a great app for finding specific type of restaurants. And there's a more here. I'll have these all linked up in the show notes for you to check out. Um, one, that, one that I really like is Couch Traveler HD. And if you're taking a staycation, you can still visit cool places with this app. And matter of fact, I was talking with my, uh, my wife at uh, dinner tonight. I said, why don't we just go to a little staycation? Actually, here in Honolulu, uh, a staycation means really going to like another island for a couple of days. And just you know, do nothing else. Just get away. Go see uh, some sites that we don't normally see here in Oahu. So I'm trying to talk her into going to Maui in a couple of weeks. So uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed here, folks, if I can talk her into doing that. And if I do, I may ask for a volunteer host for one night for the show. And uh, I'll let you know on that if we decide to do that. And uh, I'll put the word out looking for someone that would like to come in and host. Because I'll probably try to talk her into doing like a leave Thursday, be gone Friday, Saturday, then come back late. Uh, late Sunday. Hey, the official Gmail blog announced today rich text signatures. So what is a rich text signature? I'm sure many of you have got a little signature, that, um, really uh, some text that you add to the bottom of your emails. And uh, I do this as well for my official correspondence with folks. 
But this makes if you use the actual webmail portion of Gmail, you can actually add now um, the uh, your company logo and your title, and you know just make it lo look a lot better than just standard text. So that's available. You can turn that on and off at will. So they announced that over on the Gmail blog today. All right, I was pretty shocked to see this one, and I don't know how long it's going to last. But um, how many of you have seen an iAd? I have yet to see an iAd. I don't know what they're supposed to look like. If you see an iAd on your phone, please snap a pic and send it to me. But an iPhone developer today has, is bragging that he's he earned fourteen hundred dollars in iAd revenue in one day, and he actually published his numbers here. The revenue was $1,372. He had an effective CPM of $147.55. That is unbelievable. Um, this was be for 26,651 requests. He had 9,300 impressions with a fill rate of 34.9% and a click rate of 11.8. 11.8% click-through rate on any ad is beyond successful. But what blew me away was the effective CPM of $147.55. That is amazing. That's an amazing effective CPM. Um, so will this last? They don't think so. They're thinking that IADs will eventually fall down to eCPMs around $10 to $20, if not lower. Now, $10 to $20 is still pretty doggone good on a basically uh you know because most sites don't get that for web-based ads so uh we'll see but uh those are early to market and basically have these ads in, in their apps i wonder how that's going to impact their uh their app usage uh, you, you know i'd lo really love to hear some feedback from those of you that are seeing these ads and how it is affecting you and how you're using their apps and if it's annoyance or what a big article today by the Wall Street Journal, and it's a interesting uh, development here. And I think we all kind of expect um, the U.S. government to get more involved in really trying to protect infrastructure. But uh, the United this article says that the U.S. is planning a cyber shield for utility companies, and um, this is supposedly being run by the NSA. And it's a program called Perfect Citizen. It's uh, and it's kind of a weird, uh, weird way to call a program. But they're saying to detect cyber assaults on private companies and government agencies running such critical infrastructure as electricity grid, nuclear power plants, and apparently this is uh, according to people familiar with the uh, with the program. Uh, the NSA has replied and said it uh, doesn't do any type of spying or reporting. Uh, and I don't fully understand that, but defense contractor Raytheon uh, did get a contract on this. Uh, what they think that the um, value of it would be about $110 million or $100 million for the contract. And as contracts go in the government, that's a pretty small one. But, uh, of course, the government's keeping mum on this one here. But um, they are saying the overpurpose of the program is that our government feels that they need to ensure the public sector is doing all they can to secure infrastructure critical to national security, said in one internal Raytheon email, the text of which was seen by the Wall Street Journal. Um, you know, in all honesty, I don't think we want anyone hacking our nuclear power plants. I don't think we want anyone hacking our electrical infrastructure. So I don't know what to really think about this. Love to hear you guys' feedback on it. But, uh, you know, I think someone has to protect these assets, and someone has to do it in a in a good way. Um, I think they have to be pretty clear on their goals. But again, they can't. They can't say too much uh, because it you know it gives the bad guys uh, the information they need to uh, bypass or you know deal with these systems. So um, I'd be curious to see how this turns out. But uh, a pretty good article over on the Wall Street Journal on, on that. And now, speaking of hacking, Pirate Bay hack has supposedly exposed users' uh, information. So if you've had an account over on, uh, on Pirate Bay, a SQL injection vulnerability has allowed uh, one individual to download 40,000, excuse me, the usernames and email and internet addresses of more than 4 million Pirate Bay users. 
And uh, this was available over on KrebsOnSecurity.com. KrebsOnSecurity.com. Pretty scary stuff here. Um, luckily, the individual is appears to be a, you know, is not releasing all this info. And it was noted the Pirate Bay was down for a while today while they were supposedly doing maintenance on its databases. But uh, just think of the RIAA got their hands on uh, that list. <laughs> Do you have an account on the Pirate Bay? Have you been over there and created an account? Um, hope you didn't use the standard password uh, that you use on other accounts. A little uh, space news here from spacetoday.net. Dust has been found in the Hayabusa capsule. Japanese scientists have found traces of dust in a sample return capsule uh, that may or may not be from an asteroid visit. They're thinking that uh, this potentially could also be uh, space dust that was collected on the transit uh, to and from. So uh, they're going to be checking this very, very closely. This was uh, an article on spacetoday.net. Um, here's one that is a little bit troubling. NVIDIA has supposedly crippled its CPU gaming physics library really to kind of spite Intel. And I'm going to read here from the article, um, and this was over on arstetnica.com. The, basically what they're saying here is that a new investigation by David Cantor at Real World Tech adds a pile of circumstantial evidence that N NVIDIA has apparently crippled the performance of CPUs on its popular cross-platform physics acceleration library called PhysX. If it's true that PhysX has been hobbled at, on an x86 CPUs, then this move is part of a larger campaign to make the CPU and Intel and Intel in specific look weak and outdated. The physics story is important because in contrast to the usual sniping over conference papers and marketing claims, the PhysX issue could affect real users. Now, essentially what they have done is in certain instances, based upon um, if a if a NVIDIA, if there's no NVIDIA GPU, in other words, if there's a, no GPU in a gamer system, in other words, if you have a computer that doesn't have a uh, NVIDIA GPU in it, the physics code will default to running on a, on the CPU in the in the actual processor, but it doesn't run very well. It only establishes a single thread, whereas when it's running within the actual, between the NVIDIA GPU and the gamer system, it's running literally thousands of threads. And um, so what's being, and of course it also uses some, uh, uses the old x87 floating point math extensions, which is really kind of antiquated and was really stopped, used by Intel in, in 2005. And of course, the, um, the currently is SSE is the is the uh, really what's being used on the math side. So um, this could be a significant uh, play by Nvidia to really make Intel look bad. And I know there's been some bad blood over there, but uh, you better pay attention <laughs> if you're going to be buying an Nvidia gaming card. You better make sure that the GPU on your motherboard is, uh, especially with this PhysX, F-H-Y-S-X, um, symbol on the, on, the, on the actual video card. You need to make sure that you've got an NVIDIA GPU in the machine or you could uh, be seeing a major performance hit on your video card performance. So pretty crazy stuff on what NVIDIA supposedly done here. Moving on to more information that is kind of cool to know. Nearly half of Windows 7 installations are now on 64-bit. Uh, appears the transition to 64-bit computing is accelerated with the release of Windows 7. Figures published by Microsoft today claim that nearly half of Windows 7 installations, 46%, are using the 64-bit version of operating system. And this is really a huge upswing in 64-bit adoption. Window Vista, in comparison, had only 11% of its users running. And I'm on 64 on all my machines at this point. Hey, if you were part of the uh, Comcast uh, uh, fiasco, if you're a Comcast customer, and you got in on the uh, class action lawsuit, well, you uh, congratulations. You've won $16 in the litigation lottery. So uh, $16 for your trouble for <laughs> applying to be part of the class action lawsuit. And... Uh, 
<laughs> so uh, Comcast has agreed to pay 16 bucks to, or I'm sure what it is, it's capped out, um, a certain amount of damages. Yeah, it's about a million people, supposedly. and uh, But $16, that's, uh, that's what you get for uh, Comcast doing that peer-to-peer -peer blocking before. All right, there's a, a big patch Tuesday in effect. For July, uh, four bulletins. Uh, three of them are critical. One is remote. And uh, so those will be coming down the pipe here next week. So be advised on that. Keep your computers ready for their updates. Boy, there's been an outcry by legislatures about the FCC broadband plan where it's going to put, uh, they're saying it's going to put United, the United States farther back in the speed game when it comes to other countries. And uh, I have to kind of uh, give credit where credit's due to my local senator here in Hawaii, Senator Dan Inouye, um, who is the, I guess, the now the senior senator. Uh, of course, uh, he is a World War II veteran, uh, won the Medal of Honor, and uh, he really put it to the FCC. Um, he says, what is the FCC's rationale for a vision that appears to be firmly rooted in the second tier of countries. Um, he goes on to say, the National Broadband Plan proposals a goal of having 100 million homes subscribed at 100 MPS by 2020, he wrote. While the leading nations already have 100 megabits per second fiber-based services, it costs of between $30 and $40 per month. And beginning rollout of one GPS residential services, which the FCC suggests is required only for a single anchor institution in each community by 2020. This appears to suggest that the U.S. should accept a 10 to 12 year lag behind the leading nations. Now, Senator Mark Beach, Democrat of Arkansas, put it more tactfully. Why did the plan settle on the do download speed of 4 meg by 2020? It seems a little bit modest for a goal. And, um, of course, Senator Brian Dorgan, Democrat of North Dakota, wanted to know why urban areas were targeted with 100 megs per second connections and rural areas like look likely to end up with a minimum of four megs. He says, how will you structure the policies to meet these goals in a way that doesn't exaggerate, exaggerate <laughs> the existing digital divide? I want you guys to think here for a second. Just bear with me. If the FCC really wanted to set a precedence, why could they not have said that we want all Americans to have at a minimum 100 megs with the goal of having one gig connections to their homes by 2015 or 2020 instead of four megs? Let's be honest. The only way, just think what would be possible what would be possible with one gig internet connectivity in every home in America? What it would, how it could change things. The information, the ability to remotely work. You know, you could, with a one gig connection, you could have five video conferences going with uh, coworkers at work. You wouldn't have to drive into the office that's less oil consumption. There were just so many, you could do so many things. There's so much virtualization. We need to become a nation that has the absolute fastest broadband. To, to settle for anything less is, in my opinion, beyond short-sighted. And the innovation that could occur, it would, oh. what do you guys think? Do you guys, do you guys agree with me that we need to really set the benchmark much, much higher? Should we not be writing to our congressional representatives and demanding that they tell the FCC, go back to the drawing board, let's get this thing dialed in so that we're going for, you know, let's, let's make the one gig, per, uh, one gig of uh, broadband per household, make that a goal like going to the moon. Set that as a national priority. Now, apparently, the FCC doesn't care. They really submitted the answers to these questions, and he's not backing down. The, this, oh, Jenna, Jenna Kowski recently submitted his answers to these questions. He says, the plan's universe, universal, universalization targets of four megs per second download and one meg upload are aggressive. It's one of the highest universalization targets of any country in the world. 
Many nations such as South Korea and Finland adopted short-term download targets around 1 meg. The plan, recommendation, the plan recommends revaluing the 4 meg target every year, so this target may rise over time. Let, hey, forget doing this every year. Let's go, let's go for it. You know, I just, I don't get it. So, what do you guys think? Think we should get on the bandwagon here and start writing and, and, and really pushing for the FCC to scrap the 4 meg and you know, just go out there on a limb and say, we're going to go for this? So what if it, so what it, what it cost? Just think of what the return value will be to the United States. GDP will go up. It's just going to explode. It will. Okay, ISPs may rage, but Uncle Sam supports city-owned Internet. Um, this is a great article that shows a map of which states are really um, good to go as so far as being able to have um, city-owned Internet services. Um, states that are not so good are Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, Nebraska. Uh, there's a de facto ban in Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Then in states, uh, Washington, Utah, Colorado, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, and South Carolina, there's various bans. But all other states have no barriers to city-owned fiber networks. And a lot of these communities are taking advantage of this. They're getting a lot of money as part of the $7 billion stimulus funding that uh, that is part of you know basically the revitalization plan of trying to you know, get people back to work, but uh, this is you know this is big. I was I was actually pretty pleased that as many states were in the green as there is, but uh, pretty shocked that Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, there's a little you know right there kind of a all together those states interconnected somewhat um, that have complete bans. And then with Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Virginia having de facto bans, it's just as bad as those other states. But uh, I tell you, this is another thing. Write your state legislatures and promote city-owned fiber networks. And uh, that, you know, that's another way to get to one gig per second uh, connectivity to your homes. All right, peer-to-peer uh, -peer plaintiff to get 28 Time Warner IPs each month. This is, this is outstanding news. And this is uh, from uh, lawsuits that were being filed by a firm for the movies Far Cry and the Steam Experiment. Uh, basically, the judges said to the, uh, to the plaintiff here, um, Time Warner only has to provide you uh, information on 28 IPs per month. And uh, this is for those two cases. So a win on, for those of you that may have been downloading those, uh, you, it might be five years before you get your, <laughs> your lawsuit. And uh, this case with uh, Thomas Reset and the RIAA going third round here. And a pretty, pretty uh, interesting storyline. I'm not going to go into it in detail. But uh, these guys are scheduled to go back to court on October 4th for a, for a third trial. And the judge is really not happy with the RIAA. He keeps you know, slapping them with more charges and making them pay for mediation fees. Um, this judge does not like the RIAA. It's very obvious. But... Good on them. <laughs> All right, if you want to see what the new Firefox 4 looks like, there's a there's a beta out, and also uh, they've got uh, a full detail of what uh, what has changed. I have a link up to that in the show notes. Uh, but people are so far still saying it's still a memory pick, <laughs> so um, they haven't fixed that portion of it uh, of that yet. Okay. Um, the United States Cyber Command had an interesting HD5 hashtag code in its inner circle of its logo. And uh, there was a little bit of a, a race of people trying to figure out what it meant. It only took a couple hours for them to break it, but it contained the 58-word mission statement of the US, United, United States Cyber Command. And uh, I'll, have, I'll link up the show notes for you guys. You guys can check it out. Look at the logo. Look how they were really clever in embedding the MD5 hashtag in the logo. Um, that one was a smart one by someone. But anyway, they, they figured it out pretty quick. It was meant to be figured out. But uh, it's kind of cool that the, the mission statement was right in the, uh, the logo without it actually being written out. And uh, geeks really just absolutely loved this over the last couple of days to uh, do the detection and actually figure out what it uh, what, uh, the, they actually said. 
Um, hey, if you got to be careful out there with your with your iTunes account. A lot of parents are starting to see uh, big bills come in for kids uh, playing these games and stuff, and uh, the kids are thinking that they're playing with virtual money, but they're not. They're actually buying stuff in the games. So I got an article over here that's on Bloomberg Business Week about uh, a father that uh, had 375 in iTunes transactions. He thought it was actually phony charges, but it turned out it was teenage daughter playing some game, and she really didn't know. There are some settings that you can set within iOS 4 on parental controls. Make sure you know what, where they're at and use them. I have the link up to that in the uh, in the show notes. Um, last couple of articles here are really important. I don't have a lot of time to go into them, but a good one on TechDirt on describing how to create a software program now puts you at risk of contributory patent infringement. Do you know if just writing about a hack now can be uh, the reason to get a takedown notice? unbelievable landmark digital services was not very happy with individual talking about how their basically their detection system worked and basically over the weekend wrote some code that uh, actually uh, did what their uh, patent called out <laughs> and he didn't post the code for fear of lawsuit but uh, Dutch this Dutch developer is not real happy that he uh, at this point is uh, um, being uh, told to take the article down based upon what he wrote and what he determined is from an al analyzing the patent. Uh, pretty sad. All right, remember the guy from Best Buy that was going to was potentially going to be getting fired? Well, the CEO has said that uh, the gentleman can keep his job. But uh, the employees basically said, well, the company statement is 180 from what they were saying Thursday, but I guess me I guess they either made peace with the videos I left up or decided the others weren't so bad. Um, here's a statement I'm issuing as well. Right now I'm planning on taking a leave of absence, so I may survey my current career plans in future. I'm not sure if it would be comfortable returning to Best Buy considering the circumstances, but I will definitely consider all options. So, uh, dude, go out and, you know, take the bull by the horns. You create these videos, you got some great talent there. Now, I got to just go into this because this is just sickening. If you read any article tonight, you got to read this one on Hollywood accounting. Do you know what Hollywood studios are doing? For every movie they produce, they set up a, co a company. Okay? It's Company X. Then the studio charges Company X for distribution, advertising, all kinds of weird little charges. And you know what ends up happening? Is these companies always lose money. So what happens is the studios earn their money. They get their money in that way. And then these companies all lose money and don't have to pay any taxes. So it's a it's a very it's a in my opinion kind of a little ponzi scheme to uh to guarantee that movies are losing money. It actually shows that this uh the the Harry Potter in Order of the Phoenix, this is the it actually shows the actual uh, uh financial statement. I lost 167 million dollars. Can you imagine that? That movie Lost $167 million. Well, of course, after Universal took uh, $900 million in distribution fees, $230 million in advertising. Uh, what else? Uh, d oh, yeah. Uh, $609 million in uh, uh, different types of expenses. It just goes on and on and on. Advertising publicity, $131 million. Read this article, and then you're going to say, uh-huh. Okay, did you guys know that uh, Homeland Security has been sec uh, securing domains, actually seizing domains? Did you know they wanted to seize the Pirate Bay's domain? How are they doing that? How are they getting away with seizing domains? This is an interesting write-up, and one that's worth looking into a little more. It appears that I can may be involved in the domain seizure of these specific websites using technicalities. So uh, apparently U.S. government's taking control of some domains. One at risk right now is, uh, let me look, I'm not even familiar with the site. If I can find, where did they actually say it at? Uh, it, it's in the article, but how does the U.S. government just seize a site? Uh, does there have to be some sort of legal proceedings or some sort of illegal activity going on? I don't know. Okay, anyway, let's go ahead. Uh, I'm at the end of my regular content tonight, I do have uh, some voicemails to go through and emails to cover as well. 
So remember, you can always send uh, comments to the show at geeknews at gmail.com, geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline is 619-342-7365. Here comes the, uh, the first voicemail here. And everyone, when you call the voicemail hotline, be loud. Speak up. Don't, uh, don't talk softly because the, getting it through the phone system and onto the, uh, uh, the system they use and then comes to me in MP3 it seems to always be so low, so I have to really crank on the audio levels. So those that are on the show can listen to it. So don't be afraid to speak up. Here comes the, and I'm not saying that the folks on these calls didn't speak up, but that's just a general comment. Here comes the first voicemail. My wife wanted actually, and I thought I'd call in and say that's a great surprise. What I've been using is one piece together, and it's awesome. It's gonna work great for school. I really love your show. Keep up the good work, and you have a good uh, good night. All right. Hey, hey uh, congratulations on winning the the computer, and of course, uh, give your wife a big kiss for. Uh... For calling into the basically submitting this stuff for the for the show contest, it's uh, it's all on her, and she was pretty happy. You could see the comments she made on uh, on Twitter. So uh, that is actually going to be uh, being shipped by FedEx tomorrow. So uh, you should get it sometime uh, next week. Takes a couple extra days out of Honolulu, but uh, don't worry, it's forthcoming. Okay, here's the next voicemail. Hey, Todd. This is Seth from Michigan. Hey, Can Seth. Call? I've got a couple things for you. Uh, I'm listening to your most recent podcast, one from the 6th or the 7th, something like that. And you're talking about some emails you've been receiving, um, talking about criticisms of you asking for investments, um, Donations. dollar investments, towards having your um, your payment to actually receive your, your salary for oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually getting money. Well... I think that you're doing a fine thing you're doing. Just make sure you uh, all have it still volunteer-based um, and not necessarily stating a particular price. Just let people give what they can give on that. And um, and you and also you know, one other thing that's a little separate from that, the, when you start doing the video portion, um, you made a fairly big deal about it. You actually mentioned quite a few times saying that the audio portion would always come first, yep. audio would always come first. Yep. And um, you're doing fine now, but I just want to um, just say you have been going more towards, um, like during the actual podcast, you'll be saying things that relate to the video portion, which really have nothing to do with the actual audio portion, like saying the cameras were funky, stuff like that. I have no problem with how you're doing it right now. I'm just wanting to that you're doing that more often, so just keep an eye on that, that you don't do that a whole lot a uh, few months down the road. Uh, just stick with where you're at right now, and that is perfectly fine. And I got one last thing, and then I'll finish off here. Um, in your last podcast, I believe it was, or maybe two podcasts ago, I think it was the, the, the one from the second, um, you had said that you are looking for one more developer for an application or some sort of a mobile device. I know it wasn't the Droid, because you've got a Droid developer, if I remember correctly. I know you have an iPhone developer, because you have your beta iPhone app to be out here soon. And I'm just wondering if you are looking for another developer. I have a guy that I would recommend to you. Um, I actually gave him your contact info, and he's going to try and contact you the next day or two. And I'm just trying to figure out what device that was, because I don't remember what device it was, and I did not see in the show notes. So if you um, could just mention on your show, just answer on your next one, and say whether you found a developer or not, and um, what the actual application you're looking forward to do, I assume it's a basic podcatcher, but um, see what that application will do and what device it will be for, that would be, that'd be great. And uh, hopefully my voice is not too long, because uh, hopefully I just didn't add that in too much to your podcast. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you for your answers, and keep up the good show. All right, bye. Hey, thanks for your comments. And so far as the um, trying to make sure that the audio audience remains the basically the primary focus, it does. But what happens is obviously I got a lot of stuff going on here in the uh, in the studio, and I'm trying to obviously when they're doing the live show. At the time I do the live show, there's not a lot of people awake in the U.S. mainland, 
So on average, we, you know, we get a handful, maybe 12, 15 that watch the live show during the actual live recording. And then I let it play for 24 hours um, on replay. And it usually gets a significant number of people throughout the next 24 hours that watches the replay. But when I'm creating the video portion of the content, it's really for the audience that's uh, watching on the Roku device, um, watching maybe on the mobile phone later. Um, the numbers continue to go up. Significant numbers continue to go up on the video consumption. Um, obviously, what pays the bills is still those of you that uh, take the show with you and listen to the audio. So um, don't worry, I'm not going to be uh, discarding the audio portion of the show, but there is a balance here that I have to play in, in trying to uh, juggle everything on my own. At some point, the kids are going to be able to come in here and do some switching for me. Uh, we're not quite at that point. I'd hope that would be a little sooner. But because I get the show done at the time that I do, um, generally it gets running a little late for them to be in here working with me. So um, that's kind of, the, kind of the deal on that. Now, so far as the additional developer, I think right now, until Tom gets, he told me that I'm going to either see it today, uh, well, probably not today, but maybe tomorrow I'll be seeing the uh, beta of the iPhone app. My plan is, is to take the design of the iPhone app and use that same ex exact design and turn that over to the Android developer and let him develop the Android app to make it look the same so it's got the same feel to the show. I don't know if that's going to be potentially to be able to do with the BlackBerry or not, but uh, I think what I need to do at this point is to make sure the iPhone app is good, get the Android developer going, and then move into the BlackBerry. So feel free to have your friends send me an email that will definitely uh, allow me at least to have someone on tap. I don't know what he fully does. But we got to build an iPad app, too. That's probably another thing that's on the list. I don't know if I'm going to have Tom do that next or who. Um, but uh, um, I know that we're putting HTML5 into Geek News Central. That's forthcoming here soon so that the site will actually be semi-mobile ready when people come to it. Um, and I guess maybe that's what well, maybe I'll focus on next. I don't know. But uh, it's all a matter of resources as well. But uh, the more developers I have, please reach out to me because not only do I have stuff going on, but Raw Voice itself needs more developers as well. So we're always hiring developers on a contract basis to do stuff for us. So thanks for your call. And uh, let me go ahead and play the, the last uh, voicemail, and then we'll get into the email so we can get everybody out of here. Hey, Todd. This oh. is Seth from Michigan calling one more thing I got to say. Sure. Uh, hopefully I'm not taking up too much basic podcast, like I said before. So, um, so on your uh, podcast, um, you, I think you started out, I should have been listening for quite a while now. Um, if you remember, you started out with one or two. Um, you had GoDaddy and Go to Meeting as your sponsors. Right. And now you've got, I would have to think off the top of my head, either three or four. Um, I, I think it's fine as it is right now, but... I'm not sure what the rest of your Ohana is, uh, opinions are, but um, I would definitely prefer not any more advertising um, just because of the length of the, the time it takes for you to explain the, the podcast. And I realize you can always do fast forwarding and all stuff. I'd rather just listen through it, um, and I would just rather that uh, we don't have a lot of new advertisers added on on top of what you currently have. Um, what you have right now, I don't have a problem. Just, uh, I'd just rather we don't have a, a lot more added on in the future. So obviously you got to do what you can to keep the lights on and your voice and everything. I, I clearly understand that. So, um, yeah, just, just make sure that we don't have too lengthy of an explanation on all of the different um, sponsors and having too many sponsors down there just so we don't have to wait a long time for explanations. All right. Uh, that was a long explanation on my part. <laughs> All right. Uh, have a great day and keep up the good job. All right. So far as the two – see, what we do is I have two spots that I run. I run uh, – tonight we ran them a little different, but tonight I usually have two primary advertising spots in the show. I haven't been running a third, fourth, or fifth advertiser. We've never had – uh, more than three at one time. So what I'll do is I'll alternate. Like tonight was uh, GoDaddy, and of course GoDaddy is the primary sponsor of the show, and Matrix Direct. 
the next show, it'll be GoDaddy and GoToMeeting. So there'll be a little bit of an alt, you know, a, a switch up on the next show. Um, the offers page has lots of stuff, but I don't generally talk about that uh, during the show. So I don't know where the third or fourth or fifth advertiser comes from. If it sounds like I'm doing, does anybody else think I'm doing more than two? Um, we had the go to meeting giveaway um, that was part of a contest, but uh, that was just a one-off type deal. So I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't think I was doing that. So uh, I'm sure we'll get some feedback on this as well. So, but uh, if you think I'm running too much stuff, I apologize. But uh, generally, two ads is what gets run in the show as far as what I get paid for. Um, next email was from uh, from Morgan. Hey, she said, Todd, see the screenshots from my inbox? Yep, that was, well, that was just a Gmail thing, Morgan. Let me know if the newsletter today is fine. Uh, Jeremy sent me a link about uh, the AP running a story where they quoted some stuff off another site and Woot wanting $17.50 for them quoting a blog, some stuff on their blog post. I have this link up in the show notes. I thought I talked about this in the show, but I think it's pretty funny that uh, AP got a little taste of their own uh, medicine. I've gotten some responses from folks uh, considering going to CES 2011, so I look forward to talking more with all of you about that. As a matter of fact, we're starting a mailing list discussion about that. Again, congratulations to Katie. She says, hey, thank you so much. I'm shocked right now. My husband will be ecstatic. Please let me know what would be good for time to call in. And basically, I had her call the voicemail hotline to let you know that she really won. And uh, Nicholas, I got your uh, e your uh, actual address as well. So thanks for that. So you're good on your Roku box now. And uh, so we'll be able to get that sent out to you. Um, also got an email from Nicholas. Say, hey, Todd, in your last show, you asked about the battery life on the Droid phones. Well, I just got my Droid Incredible. Uh, last week, and let me just say that this phone lives up to its name. I love this phone, but it does have one major flaw, and it's the battery life. I have a hard time making it through the day without charging. However, I did find a YouTube video about where they show how you increase the battery life, and it really works. So it looks like the battery issue is mostly firmware related. The fix is to charge your phone as you normally would. Then once it shows that it's fully charged, unplug the phone and power it off on the phone. Once once the phone is off, plug it back in, let it charge until the indicator light is green. Then power up. This allows me to make it through the day on one charge. That's weird. Uh, Sam, I'm going to be, of course, I talked about you a little earlier in the show. Thanks for your email. Got an email from Nick. He says, hey, Todd, um, I use Gmail web interface daily and do not use any email software to read mail. The, this, and basically, this goes into a problem he's having. This problem is only happening on my personal Gmail account. My other Gmail account seems to be fine. The Gmail problem started about four days ago. In the Gmail help form, this problem is brought, but brought up, but it looks like nobody has solved the problem. Problem in standard Gmail view messages in the inbox do not load. The chat box on the left column labels does not load up. Also, at the bottom, you're currently using the last account activity is missing, not loading. When I click on the message, right now I'm using the HTML view. It can compose and read my messages, but a lot of Gmail features are missing. Um, if you're the GNC on having more ideas, please let me know. And Nick, did they get that fixed, or if they were talking about it in the... Uh, in the actual forums, I would assume something wasn't quite right. But is anybody else seeing this? And uh, if you do, just let's get Nick, uh, Nick some feedback. Uh, of course, I will thank Andrew for his link to the uh, Digital Emily product as well. Oh, here's here it is. Nick says, hey, Todd, the uh, web interface is fixed. My account's okay. This is a later email. I should have read these in advance so we don't have to reply to Nick. <laughs> he said, hey, Todd, I'm glad you're covering Canadian content, but while it's great mobile ISPs can block can't block traffic anymore they are still able to delay traffic they say it is not time sensitive without any issue even or even on your wired internet so they will probably allow traffic but slow it down to the point it's unusable in my area there's no isp that does not have horrible traffic shaping on their internet for peer-to-peer -peer. since you're talking about windows phone 7 I, I was actually contacted by a canadian microsoft rep who was going to the canadian developers and asking them for uh, asking them to port their apps over to windows phone 7 so far, I don't plan to because of the time constraint, but it looks like they're really trying. Also, in case you don't know, it looks like Canada will be getting factory unlocked iPhone 4s if you pay full price and get it through Apple. The 8 G gigabyte 3G is already being sold unlocked, and it's assumed the iPhone 4 will be the same when it comes out here. P.S. Did you ever get me an email where I told you that I, what I wanted? Hey, send me your – Jason, send me an email on that and your address. I don't think I ever did. So email that to me again, okay? What you wanted out of the store, okay? So send that over to me. 
Um, got an email here from Yitz. He said, you're talking on show 580 about how long it takes you to laptop to boot another person. Again, Yitz, I got so many people saying, check out Saluto. I have. It works great. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the, submit, the suggestion. Okay, we're long. Need to get out of here. Everyone, thanks for hanging out with me. It's been fun. And uh, we'll be back with you uh, Monday night for the live show Tuesday morning. Well, the show will be released into uh, those of you that have the system set up to grab it via podcast or iTunes or Zoom Marketplace. So uh, thanks for hanging with me. And we'll see you next time. Everyone take care. Geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline 619-342-7365. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Everyone take care and aloha.